In Ethics of Our Fathers, uh, Chapter 6, it states, Haloi meid mi chavedoi perik echod, oi halocha achas, oi posik echod, oi dibur echod, oi afilu ois achas, tzorich linig boi covered. It says, one who learns from his friend, his fellow man, one chapter in Torah, one law in Torah, one passage in Torah, one word in Torah, even one letter in Torah, says the ethics of our fathers, Tzarech Linhag Boy covered. He must show him honor. Shekei Matzinu B'David Melech Yisrael. What's the proof? We find that King David, who was a king, Shaloi Lomad Machi Tzayfel El Lishnei Dvarim Bilvat. He learned from Machi Tzayfel two things, alone, and still no Kuroi Raboi Alufoi Umidoi, and yet he called him his teacher, his guide, his mentor. Shinemar, as it says in the book of Tehillim, Vaata Enoish Kerki Alufi Umidoi. As it stated, you are a man equal to me. You are my guide and my mentor. And here we have a fortiori argument. We have an obvious inference. If this is true, that the king David, who was the king of Israel, El Shnei Dvarim Bilvad, he only learned from Achi Seifel. Two things, still in all, Kroi Raboi Alufay Medoi, still in all, he called him his teacher, his guide, his mentor. Haloi me mechavedoi perigechod, oi loch achas, oi posigechod, oi diburechod, oi afilu oi sachas. Alachas kama vikama, shetzarech linig boi kovit. And therefore, if a person learns from his friend, even one chapter or one law or one verse or one word or even one letter, surely, surely you must give that person honor. In other words, you are not a king. And still in all, you learned something from your friend. Surely you have to give your friend honor. If it ain't covered elevator, what is honor? Honor is Torah. Shinem, as it says, covered chachamim yincholu. As it says, the wise shall inherit honor. Usamimim yincholu toiv. And the perfect shall inherit good. And furthermore, ain toiv ela toirah. And the true good is only Torah. Shinem, as it says, ki lekach toiv nasati lachem. As it says, I have given you a good teaching, and therefore do not forsake my Torah. So this is the teaching here in Ethics of Our Fathers, Chapter 6. So let us try to understand it on a level of Pshat and Remez and Grush and Soin and Chesidus, on five levels, and try to uh, analyze the teaching here and to internalize it in our daily life. First and foremost, let's understand it on a level of pshat. What is the two things that King David learned from Achitoifel? So, the Bartonura says that the two things he learned from Achitoifel was, number one, not to learn alone, to have a study partner. One day, Achisoifel came into the room and he saw King David studying. And Achisoifel was his guide, his advisor. He was the advisor of King David. And he told King David, why do you learn alone? If you truly want to remember your studies and if you truly want to understand it well, you should have a study partner. Number two, the second thing he taught King David, that King David walked into the base medrash, he came into the study hall, standing up straight as a king, and he told him, you know, when you walk into a study hall, you are coming into God's house, and therefore you should walk in more humble, and therefore 
bent over a bit. There's another approach, and that is he taught him when you walk into the study hall, you should walk in swiftly, like a, a brisk walk, to come in firm, with dignity, because you're going into the king's home, you're going into God's home, and this is a home of Torah, and therefore you should come in with tremendous strength when you walk in to the home of God. So these are the two things that Achisefel taught King David. Number one is not to study alone, and number two is to enter into the study hall with swiftness, with vigor, with zest, and with strength. That's the pshat. And even though Achisefel was a wicked person, because later he joined the rebellion against King David when Avshalim declared himself as king. Achisefel went to the side of Avshalim. So he was, he was wicked. He did not follow and give his allegiance to King David. And therefore he was a Russia, and ultimately, in the end of his life, he committed suicide, realizing he made a mistake. <coughs> Still no, King David gave him honor for the two things that he taught him. That is the pshat of the Mishnah. What's the remez, the hint? The Mishnah says, ain't tov el Torah. The true good is Torah. In other words, ice cream is not so good, and uh, cigars is not so good. What is truly good, the ultimate good, the ultimate tov, the ultimate good is Torah. Which answers a very interesting question. And that is, the word tov, which means good, has the gematria of number 17. If you count from the first portion in the Torah, 17 portions, Bereshis, Noyach, Lechacha, etc., etc., you will find that the 17th portion is the portion of Yisrael. And that is the portion where God gives the Torah to the Jewish people. So here it's a hint, it's a remez to where we find the giving of the Torah in the Torah. And that is the 17th portion of the Torah, the portion of Yisrael, where God gives the Ten Commandments to the Jewish people. Furthermore, the concept of Rem is a hint, is a hint for the future. And that is when Mashiach will come, we will see the Ein Toi Vela Torah. When Mashiach will come very soon, speedily in our days, and as the Rebbe has said that we are living now in the, the last generation of exile and the first generation of redemption. So very soon we will see Mashiach with our own eyes. Amen, Ken Yiratsun. Then we will know the Ein Toi Vela Torah. Then we will know that the only good is Torah. Today we study Torah and we learn Torah and we fulfill Torah. But many of us also feel that there are other goods or other essentials in the world outside of Torah. When Mashiach will come, we will see that the only good in the world is Torah. And therefore it says that Rambam, when Mashiach will come, that all the money and all the valuable things will be found like the dust of the earth. Why? Because it will be like the dust of the earth. Compared to Torah, everything else will be worthless. Yes, you will have all the money in the world, but money won't matter. Money won't count. What will count, what will be important to us, is the study of Torah. What is Drush? So the question over here is asked. It says that Davra Melech studied or learned from Achisoifel two things. And the Mishnah goes on to say, Bilvad only. Why did the Mishnah have to add that word, Bilvad? The Mishnah, which is concise to begin with, and the Beraisa, and we know that the sixth chapter of 
ethics of our fathers is a beraisa. So why does it add the additional word bilvar only? Davra Melech studied from Achisoyvil only two things. To say he studied two things, and yet he called him rabbi, mentor, etc., etc. Why bilvar only? So the Baal Shem Tov explains that in truth, if a person studies Torah from a rabbi who's God-fearing and holy, then the Torah that you study from that rabbi is pru revu. In other words, that Torah begins to be fruitful and multiply. And even though the rabbi perhaps said only two things, but after you, you analyze what the rabbi said, you say, you know what? Wow, that inspired me to something else. Or this gives me insight to a third idea, and a fourth idea, etc., etc. So it's not only two things. However, Achi Soifel, who was not a righteous person, who was not a God-fearing person, for him, it was only two things. He only taught David two things because David could not derive any more things after that. It was only two things and no more. In contrast to a, a good teacher or a God-fearing teacher who teaches even one letter, from that one letter you could learn many, many things. And that is a fortiori argument here. That Achi Teufel only taught King David two things and that was a stop sign. King David could not go beyond that. Surely if you learn from your neighbor even one letter and that one letter teaches you many things Surely you have to give that person honor and kavod. So this is the, the teaching of the Baal Shem Tov, the drush, on the word bilvad. Only these two things, nothing more. We move on to soid, the esoteric level of the Torah. What is the soid over here in the Mishnah? Perhaps we can say that the soid is the fact that the Mishnah quotes over here five things. The Mishnah starts by saying, if you learn from your friend one chapter, one law, one verse, one word, one letter, the Mishnah could have simply said, if you learn from your friend one letter, you have to give the person honor. Surely, we would come to the conclusion on our own Surely if you learn the one word, and one verse, and one law, and one chapter, surely you would have to give that person honor. Why does the Mishnah have to mention all five different things? Because the Mishnah is hinting here to the five levels of Torah. And each one in its own right is holy. There's a level of Pshat, and then Remez, and then Drush, and then Tzoyed, and Chesidus. And each one of these things are enough that if you learned even one of these things, only Pshat, or only Rembez, or only Drush, or only Said, or only Chesidus, but you learned it from a teacher that was trustworthy and, and God-fearing, that one item is enough to bring you to learn many, many more things. And therefore you are required to call that person Rabbi, Alufoy, Mdoi, my teacher, my guide, my mentor, etc., etc. What does it mean, on a literal sense, that you learn from your teacher first one chapter, and then it's seemingly going down? And then it goes on to say, one law. It should be the opposite. It should say one letter, and then one word, and then one verse, etc., etc. But in truth, what the, what the ethics of our fathers is teaching us here is as follows. You can learn from a person in one chapter, but it's very vague, it's very general. And then you can learn a halacha, a detail of that chapter. And that halacha is done much more in depth. For example, the Rebbe said that even though we learn every day three chapters a day, or, or some people learn one chapter a day of Rambam, 
And those who can't do that should learn one mitzvah a day of Rambam. So if you're learning three chapters a day of Rambam, the Rebbe said, still no, you should take one halacha, one law of these three chapters, and learn that one halacha, that one law in depth. So the three chapters, or the one chapter you learned in general. But now, you're taking that chapter and you bring it down to a halacha. You're beginning to analyze each detail of that chapter. And then you get even more detailed into a pasuk to understand it on a deeper level. And then you are able to encapsulate it into one word and to understand that word very well. And then you go even deeper into one letter. What does it mean, one letter? We know uh, there are many examples given to this in the Talmud. The Talmud says that if a person by mistake changes just one letter, and even a similar looking letter, like for example, he changes or exchanges the, the Dalit for a Resh, or a Resh for a Dalit, he's machriv oilmais, he's destroying worlds. Why? Because we say, Shema Yisrael, here O Israel, God is our Lord, God is one, Hashem Echad. If the little dot of the Dalit is missing, it becomes a Resh, it becomes Hashem Acher, God is other, other gods. One letter can change the entire meaning. More than that, one letter can destroy worlds. And the Rambam says, not only when it comes to changing the meaning, but even when we're talking about mali v'chaser, in other words. There are certain words in the Torah that has a vav, and certain words that don't have a vav. The word the teitafos, which represents the tefillin, sometimes has an additional vav, and sometimes not. It doesn't change the meaning, yet the Rambam says, if you leave out that vav, or if you put the vav in when it doesn't belong there, you add that additional vowel, it's not kosher. So that one letter can make the entire Sefer Torah, an entire Torah scroll kosher or not kosher. Furthermore, it's interesting to note that the Gemara in Shabbos, page 104, side A, goes on to explain the meaning of each letter of the Torah, what Aleph means, and what Bez means, and what Gimel means, and Dalet means, etc., etc. It's interesting over there that who is the one that is listening to all of these teachings? That is Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi. The Gemara goes over there and says, the rabbis told Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi, you should know that we heard from children things that Yeshua ben Nun did not teach in his day. And they go on to tell Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi all the different interpretations from the 22 letters of the Olive Base, which perhaps sheds some light to why in this Mishnah we talk about the concept of Ois Achas, one letter. Because the previous Mishnah is Omar Rabbi Shua ben Levi. And this Mishnah is really a continuation. Who is the author of this Mishnah? It seems that the author of this Mishnah is Rabbi Shua ben Levi. And Rabbi Shua ben Levi was the one that knew the insights for every letter in the Torah. Therefore he comes along and he says, even one letter, you have to give a person credit and honor and call him alufoy and rabboy midoy. And of course we know the famous story of the Alter Rebbe that he once called a disciple into his office and he said, you have a mitzvah and I have a mitzvah. Your mitzvah is to support your family. My mitzvah is to teach my child Torah. We will swap mitzvahs. I will give you money to teach my child Torah. And how should you teach him Torah? Start with the olive base. Vas is an alif, a pintle of an oibin, a pintle of an untin, on the kavir shemayim biemsa. He said, what's an alif? A dot on the top, and a dot on the bottom, and a line of yira shemayim, fear of heaven in between. The dot on the top represents God that is indivisible. 
the data on the body represents a yid. It's a yud, a yid, a Jew. How does a Jew connect with God through the vav, the line in between, which is the concept of yid shemaim to accept the yoke of God upon oneself. So here we see that even in one letter, we have all the secrets of the Torah. And the Rebbe would say that when you teach a child, come, it's Aleph A. The Aleph, together with the Nekud, the vowel, you are to tell that child, you should know, that this come, it's Aleph A, is the same come, it's Aleph A, that God said in the Ten Commandments. Anoichi, I am God your Lord. So by saying A, come, it's Aleph A, you are connecting this child back to Sinai. And back to God who gave the Torah on Sinai. So this is the power of Afilu Ois Achas. Even one letter. And similarly we know in chapter 5 of Ethics of Our Fathers Ben Bagbag says Hafachba Delve into it and delve into it for the entire Torah is in it. In other words, even in one letter of the Torah you can derive the entire Torah. So this is the power of afilu ois achas, even one letter of the Torah. You can derive so many concepts. And we know that Rabbi Kiva would learn mounds upon mounds of halacha from not only the letters, but the crowns upon the letters. So this is the idea of soyd, the secrets of the letters. And we know that in Kabbalah, and the Chassidus, it talks about the graphic design of the letter. Now, the Rebbe writes in Tanya that why is each letter different? Because each letter represents a different energy of God that came down into the world. And when God created the world with ten utterances of speech, says the Al Shem Tov, that Hashem forever those ten utterances that God said is standing today in the heavens. In other words, the letters themselves bring vitality and sustenance to the entire world. That is the power of Afilu Oisachas, even one letter. What does Chasidus say? So Chasidus asks the following question. We just said that Achisoifel taught King David two things bilvad alone, only two things, and not more. Because he was not a God-fearing person, he was a sinner, King David was not able to derive any additional concepts from his teaching. But we find a very interesting teaching in the Gemara. The Gemara says, the Gemara says in the tract of, of, of Sukkah that when King David was excavating the pits underneath the altar, so the waters of the deep came up and threatened to flood the entire world. And David Amelech ran into the study hall. And he asked the following question. Can we take a shard and write the name of God on it and throw it into the water? And by doing so, this will pacify the waters and cause the waters to cease. And nobody responded. And finally he said, if you don't respond, I'm going to take off your head. So Achisoifel responds, and he says like this, you have a Kalvachim, a 40 year argument. We know that if a woman was suspected of infidelity, so we bring her to the Holy Temple, and the Kohen writes the chapter of the Sota on a piece of parchment, and then he erases the ink of the parchment into a cup of water, and she drinks that water. If she sinned, she blows up together with the other man that she committed the sin with. 
If she did not sin, then she's blessed with, with, with the beautiful children and easy childbirth, etc., etc. But Achisoifah goes on to say, look, if to save one marriage, God is willing to erase his name by telling the Kohen to erase my name and put it into the water to save the marriage between husband and wife. How much more so to save the world, to save the Jewish people, to save all the nations of the world. Of course, you are allowed to write God's name on a shard and throw it into the deep. That was the story in the Talmud. When you read the story, you say, wow, Achisoyf will save the whole world. How can you say he's wicked? How can you say that his Torah knowledge did not produce fruit? Look, it did. Because of him, King David threw the shard into the water. So the answer is, number one, Rashi already tells us that King David knew the answer on his own. But being that Achisoyf was there, and he was his teacher, you're not allowed to state a law in the presence of your teacher, so therefore he needed to ask it as a question. Does anybody know if I can do this? Already he had the solution on his own. But he did not want to state and affirm a law in the presence of his teacher. That's what Ashley says. Another approach is, as the Rebbe explains, that when it comes to, to learning Torah, there are two types of disciples. One disciple is that he hears the words of his teacher and he becomes like a robot and he pays lip service and he simply repeats what the teacher said. There's another type of student that hears the words of the teacher, then analyzes it and makes it his own. So it's not that it's the words of the teacher. No, it's the words of the disciple. And that's why we find that it says a rabbi that forgives his honor he has a right to do that. Yet a king who says I'm going to forgive my honor he has no right to do that. And the answer is why? What's the difference? Why can't the king give up his honor but a rabbi could give up his honor? It says like this because a king his honor was not acquired. It was given to him. His father was the king, now he's a king. So you did not work for it, you have no right to give it up. But a Torah scholar, you worked on it, you worked for it, you acquired the wisdom. You acquired it, it's yours. If it's yours, you have a right to give up the honor for it. David HaMelech acquired this knowledge on his own. It was not from Achi Teufel. It wasn't that Achi Teufel inspired him and therefore he knew the knowledge. Dover Melech on his own developed this understanding and he internalized this understanding and therefore became Dover Melech's teaching and because of that he was able to save the world. David saved the world, not Achi Teufel. We find in general that there are three partners when it comes to the birth of a child. There is the husband and there's wife, the wife and Almighty God. The main partner is of course Almighty God. He gives one the power of continuity. And that is why you find very often that the husband and wife are healthy. Everything is working properly and yet the woman won't conceive, or God forbid she'll conceive, but she doesn't have the ability to carry the child through. Why? Because the third partner is not involved. And the same is true with Torah. When it comes to the study of Torah, a person can study Torah on his own, but yet if he doesn't bring God into the Torah, the Torah does not become fruitful. It does not produce fruit. It does not become eternal. And therefore, when we study the Torah, we need to bring God into the Torah. The Medrash tells us that this was the greatness of King David. That he was Machaber Torah Shalmaila Ima Kadish Baruch Hu. And that is, he connected the Torah above with God. What does that mean? As the Rebbe explains, that he brought the Or Ein Sof, the infinite light, 
of God into the wisdom of the Torah. Because Torah could be wisdom alone, without the light of God. And that is if a person studies Torah simply because he wants to become smarter, he wants to show off, or he's a brilliant individual who wants to acquire knowledge. However, the proper way to study Torah is first to make a bracha. And that's why when you get called to the Torah, you make a bracha first. In the morning before you study Torah, you make a bracha first. The word bracha means to bring down. Baruch means to bring down. And that is you first bring down God into the Torah. You acknowledge that God is in the Torah. And through the study of Torah, we are not only acquiring wisdom, but by studying Torah, we are becoming one with God. When a person studies Torah in that way, you now have a partner in your Torah study. When you have a partner in your Torah study, you have the ability to produce offsprings. You have the ability that this Torah continues to inspire others, and from that Torah you can derive new insights, and that Torah becomes eternal. And this is something that every Jew can do. And that is the lesson of this mission of ethics of our fathers. Not to study Torah like Achi Soifel, that only study the intellect of the Torah, but to study Torah like David HaMelech to bring God into the Torah and to connect with God when you study the Torah. And by doing so, we become more refined, we become elevated, we become holier. And by doing so, we make the world a better place and a holier place and a more beautiful place. A famous story is told that Moshe Rabbeinu, the giver of the Torah, was sitting in paradise and he heard this brilliant young lecturer giving insight to the Torah. And Moshe Rabbeinu was blown away by this guy. He says, God, who's this genius? He's amazing. So God says to him, who? Rabbi Akiva, that guy? Yeah, Rabbi Akiva, he's amazing. He has such insights to the Torah. He even interprets the crowns on the Torah. And he makes mounds and mounds of laws based on the crowns. This guy is a genius. I am so humble before him. And Moses felt embarrassed in the presence of Rabbi Akiva. God says to Moshe, hold on Moshe. Don't become so humble yet. Stay here a few more moments and listen to the end of the lecture. And Moshe Rabbeinu continues to listen. And he hears how Rabbi Akiva says, and all of this wisdom that I just taught all came from Moses on Sinai. <laughs> And Moses turns to God and says, God, I never said that. And God tells Moses, you gave the general law. And Rabbi Kiva derived from you all of these teachings. Because Moshe was a Rav Hogun, because he was a proper teacher, a God-fearing teacher, we say that kol ma'ashetal mudvosik osid lizchadesh hakel nidda l'moshim isina. Because Moshe was truly God-fearing, we say every student today that finds a new insight in the Torah, all of this was given from Moses on Sinai. We hope and pray that very soon to hear the Torah of Mashiach himself. As it says, Torah chadashem a new Torah will come with the coming of Mashiach. But even that Torah was given from Moshe on Sinai. And so shall it be speedily in our days. Mm -hmm.